125 cc regional supercross championships in 1991 and 92 turned his attention in 1993 to the chase for the prestigious AMA 250 supercross crown. At round three of the series in Anaheim, California, the rookie rider shocked the competition and fans alike by capturing the win. Lightning had struck. Before that 1993 season ended, it struck nine more times. The ten wins were the most ever recorded in a single season of Supercross racing. McGrath earned the name Showtime, and Jeremy McGrath became the first rookie in history to win the prestigious Supercross crown. Was McGrath for real? Only Bob Hanna and Jeff Stanton had won back-to-back -back crowns. Was McGrath worthy of joining that elite group? In other words, would lightning strike again? as hard and then like a three four weeks before the races I start really getting into it where this time I tried harder and um, you know hopefully I'll see some results quicker in the Supercross season so that halfway through I'm not just getting started start winning you know I'll be winning right off the bat. It's a new bike I'm happy with everything that's, that's gone on during the winter all the testing has been great my mechanics been pushing me pretty hard and um, I feel like I can be a, you know a good competitor right now I can go up there and run at the top. I prepared myself a lot differently differently than I have any other year. I've been doing it for a lot of years and I, I basically I had to. I was just burnt out last year, had no fun. So uh, I predict that you know I'm gonna be a contender all the way through this thing to win in every race. You know I'm gonna be I'm gonna be right there banging bars with whoever's up front because I'm having fun and it's uh, I brought the energy back into it. One of the main things that I have to do this year is to stay healthy because you know most other stuff will come. So it's just uh, not taking any chances and, you know, making sure before I do anything that I feel up to it. I had a pretty good off-season in Europe, and uh, I don't know, I expect to keep, keep the ball rolling. There's some guys that are riding really good, but uh, I, think, I think I'm feeling strong and ready to win. And with those words from some of the anticipated contenders for the 1994 Supercross Championship, the gate dropped in Orlando, Florida on the opening round, and the season was underway. For the next hour, we'll look back on the chase for the title. We'll hear from the riders that enjoyed moments of glory and all too often suffered the agony of defeat. The first hole shot of the year went to privateer Larry Ward riding the No Lean Sizzler restaurant Yamaha. Behind was Jeremy McGrath and Honda teammates Doug Henry, number eight, and three-time Supercross champ Jeff Stanton, number five. McGrath wasted no time. He flew even with Ward, gave him a look, and made the pass. For two title hopefuls, the season got off to a smashing start, literally. Swink, number 10, and Mike Kidrowski took each other out in the first lap. Neither rider was injured, but they were both out of contention. Back to the front of the pack, where Larry Ward is now in third place behind the leader McGrath and Doug Henry. Third place, though, is in jeopardy as Jeff Stanton has drawn a beat on Ward. Stanton has his mind set on Hondas running 1-2-3. After the race, Stanton described what happened. I was just praying that I wouldn't end up on the ground. And I could see he was out of control, and his bike was coming at me, and so I was just hoping I wouldn't end up on the ground. Stanton's prayers were answered. By the narrowest of margins, the veteran Honda rider took control of second place. Larry Ward picked himself up and finished 17th. Meanwhile, Mike LaRocco was running a typical Mike LaRocco race. That being starred in the middle of the pack, passed everything in sight on the way to the front of the pack. That was Steve Lance, who just went by, and now he's after Doug Henry, who a few corners earlier had been passed by Stanton. No problem. And LaRocco has just disposed of one half of Team Honda. Morocco had won the Orlando season opener two years running. He was out to make it three. Morocco quickly moved to the rear wheel of second place Jeff Stanton. In a series of jumps, Morocco pulled alongside and appeared to have the pass made. But Stanton had the inside line and blocked Morocco. But hey, Morocco didn't pass half the field to settle for third. A few corners later, he was set to try again. This time, he would get the job done. Two riders went at it side by side in a series of whoops. This time, Morocco had the inside line and the pass was made. A bonsai charge? Mike Morocco said no. I was pretty much in control. I really didn't make too many mistakes. So, uh, you know, I knew that usually if I do ride out of my control, I make some mistakes and lose some time. So 
I, you know, I made up time on every lap, so I wasn't controlling. I felt really good. Time running out, McGrath was cruising. One eye was on the lookout for the checkered flag, the other on LaRocco. I had a pace going through the whole race, and uh, I wasn't going to change my pace because that's when you mess up. I mean, I could see him coming, but I could tell that I had enough laps to where if I kept my same pace that I could still win the race. Well, uh, you know, I felt like I was riding good. I was just a little disappointed in my start. Uh, you know, like I said, I, need, I needed to get out front to, to beat Jeremy, and, and I was too far back to do that. So that's what I'm a little unha unhappy with. It's a tough track. It was really rutted, and Morocco was on the gas for sure. Uh, but I did just what I wanted to do. I got a good start. I kind of screwed up there in the middle, like third lap or so. But I got it together and started riding and uh, pulled it off. From Orlando, the stars of the Supercross Series packed their bags to begin the first Western swing of the season. First stop, the Houston Astrodome. The gate is about to fall on the main event. Let's watch the start. For the second race in a row, the field was led through corner number one by a Yamaha. This time, it was the factory bike ridden by Jeff Emmy. Close behind were the Yamahas of Larry Ward in second and Michael Craig third. Those positions are about to change. Larry Ward forced Emig to the bales as he made the pass to take the lead. Emig lost his momentum, and Craig moved to second place. Now back in the field, juggling positions were Kudrowski, McGrath, and LaRocco. All three had suffered poor starts. They needed to pass in wholesale lots to get to the front of the pack before the leaders got away. Of the three, McGrath was easily the most aggressive. He disposed of Kudrowski, then went after Jeff Matasevich, rider number 21. Watch this to begin to understand McGrath's Supercross style. Unlike most other riders, McGrath does not wait for traffic to thin out. At the front or rear of the pack, McGrath rides the opening laps with nothing held back. And on occasion, he takes a risk. Like that move on Suzuki's Brian Swink. Coming up, another look at what could have been total disaster. McGrath, by the narrowest of margins, missed landing on Honda teammate Jeff Stanton, then collected Brian Swink. Lightning strikes in mysterious ways. In sixth place, McGrath had the leaders in sight. It was now a matter of picking off, one by one, those who stood between himself and the checkered flag. A pair of Honda teammates were the next to fall as McGrath disposed of Stanton and Steve Lampson. Jeremy McGrath, the defending Supercross champ, was on a roll. Next on the hit list, Michael Craig. Watch McGrath. He'll pull alongside. He'll look over at Michael Craig as if to say, hey, you're in my space. Then made the pass. Now in third place, McGrath is after Jeff Emick, rider number six. Emick would prove to be a more formidable opponent. Emick, feeling the pressure of Jeremy McGrath, gaining ground behind him, picked up the pace. Emick, with McGrath in tow, moved to the rear wheel of race leader Larry Ward. Ward, for the second week in a row, was under pressure from running at the front of the pack. It was the factory Yamaha versus the privateer of Ward. Jeff Emick disposes of Larry Ward. At this point in the race, it was Jeff Emig out front, Larry Ward in second, Jeremy McGrath in third. Behind the race leaders, Mike Kidrowski and Mike LaRocco were struggling to catch up. LaRocco catches up to Michael Cray. The two riders battle. Yamaha versus Kawasaki. Mike LaRocco moved to the inside and over the finish line jump, made the pass. Mike LaRocco was now in third place. Meanwhile, Jeremy McGrath had disposed of Larry Ward and was in another battle with Jeff Emig over the number one position. And with that stuff, Emig went into the bales. Jeremy McGrath went into the lead. Mike LaRocco quickly caught to the rear wheel of Jeff Emig, and he too will make the pass to move into second place. It would again be, for the second week in a row, a Jeremy McGrath and Mike LaRocco shootout to the finish line. Morocco again coming from out of the pack trying to catch Jeremy McGrath. A pattern established in 1993 and a carryover into 1994. With the laps winding down, Mike Morocco was this close, but time would run out. Morocco would settle for second place. Well, I felt confident for a while, then I seen uh, Mike coming on strong, so then I had to pick up the pace again, and uh, you know, I think that's the toughest race I've ever had to race, and uh, the last six laps were pretty tough. The last lap in Houston, the pair of riders, LaRocco and McGrath, are headed for the checkered flag. LaRocco needs a new plan to beat McGrath. 
Well, I think the best thing to do is to get out in front of him, which, uh, again, tonight I didn't do, but I definitely have the speed to do it. And, uh, you know, I caught Jeremy towards the end of that race. I just, uh, I was just kind of hanging in there trying to find him, uh, you know, a place where I could pass him, but, uh, you know, he wasn't making any mistakes, so he made it tough. Michael Rocco headed for the pits while Jeremy McGrath acknowledged the cheers of the crowd with a victory lap. From 15th place at the start of the race to the checkered flag, it was possibly the finest win of McGrath's career. Absent from the top 10 was Mike Kidrowski. He had crashed for the second week in a row. I just kind of got off to a slow start this year and uh, been running back in the backpack, not getting good starts. And, you know, when you're back there, you're fighting with a lot of guys you maybe you shouldn't be. And uh, so we got to change that around. Anaheim Stadium, the site of Jeremy McGrath's first ever Supercross win. The venue was located about 50 miles from McGrath's home. Needless to say, Kudrowski, LaRocco, and the rest of the title contenders had minimal crowd support. Watch as the field rounds corner number one. Third week in a row, rider number seven, Mike LaRocco, is back in the pack. For LaRocco, though, the poor hole shot was the least of his problems. Yeah, I, uh, when I landed off that uh, little triple jump after the whoops, I landed real hard. and. When I did land, it uh, something in the inside of my bike broke, and it just started making a lot of noise. Yeah, I felt uh, you know I was in a good position that I had a chance this year to you know to take the title away from Jeremy. He's riding good, but uh, I think I had the speed to do it, and uh, you know it's just can make it a lot harder this way. It was only the third event of the season, and although Mike Morocco maintained a positive attitude, his season had fallen apart. He would need a McGrath breakdown to pull back into title contention. At the front of the pack in Anaheim, Jeff Emig and Jeremy McGrath had passed Larry Ward. McGrath had found the right combination to pass Emig for the lead. Usually when McGrath takes the lead, it's all over, but not in Anaheim. Emig got tough and regained the point position. Behind the leaders, Jeff Stanton caught Larry Ward. His pass attempt nearly put him on the ground, but Stanton kept the throttle on and recovered. That left him with the fastest line through the corner, and he moved to the number three slot. A few laps later, it was a three-way battle for the lead when Emig bobbled in a series of whoops. McGrath made the pass and began to pull away. Then it was Stanton's turn. Riding his best race of the young season, Stanton pulled into second place. At the outset of the season, Stanton had claimed a revitalized interest in Supercross. That pass was an indication the three-time champ meant what he said. Mike Kidrowski was also on the move. He had caught number eight, Doug Henry, resulting in this battle for fifth. Henry, the 1993 125 Eastern champ, is about to get a lesson in the not too gentle art of block passing. Hello, Hay Bales. Goodbye, Mike Kidrowski. For the first time in the season, McGrath was out front with no one chasing him. On the last lap with a clear track, Jeremy McGrath reminded the crowd why his nickname is Showtime. Got a great start, you know, my 1-800 Honda Collect bike was running great, you know. I, I mean, couldn't have done it no better. That's the kind of lead I like when I, when I win the races, and the track was perfect for me. I mean, technical, it was just like my backyard. I wonder if McGrath builds a new track in his backyard every week to practice on the upcoming Supercross event. And also, do you suppose when McGrath is in his backyard, he practices waving to the crowd? And how about finish line jumps? Watch the one coming up. McGrath claims win number three on the season. Larry Ward took top privateer honors with a strong third place finish behind Stanton and McGrath. Mike Kudrowski passed Emig to claim fourth. Here are the rest of the top ten. Matasevich, Lampson, Swing, Craig, and Henry. Here are the standings after three rounds of the 1994 Supercross season. Round four, heat race number one is in progress. Keep your eye on the left side of your screen. Jeff Stanton just demonstrated how not to complete a jump. Three-time champ hit the ground hard but was unhurt. Watch it again in slow motion. The takeoff was the problem. Stanton was headed for the hay bales on the side of the track. Tried to correct in midair, but he missed and he was on the ground. Now let's jump to the second heat race of the night. A familiar sight, McGrath out front. Coming up, an unfamiliar sight. Now you watch as McGrath bobbles and is run into by Michael Craig. 
I'll tell you that in San Diego McGrath was not the favorite in the main event. He was sick from the flu and had trouble breathing. McGrath of course did not make the main event out of the heat race had to go to the semifinal where he was beaten by Michael Craig a prime opportunity for the competition to gain championship points. Take another look. The Stanton and McGrath crashes were a mere sample of what was ahead. San Diego marked the return to Supercross racing of the ever popular Ron Lachine. The dogger had high hopes for a strong finish but in the first corner his hopes ended up on the ground. Out front for the fourth time in as many races a Yamaha riding as a privateer Jeff Matasevich in the early going led the factory Yamaha of Michael Craig Honda Steve Lampson Jeremy McGrath and Mike LaRocco. On a triple jump, Lampson came up short, allowing McGrath and LaRocco to move into third and fourth. Then it was Matasevich's turn to make a mistake. Michael Craig will take the point position, and Jeremy McGrath will soon follow suit. Now, prior to the race, McGrath had announced his strategy. To offset his weak condition, he wanted a hole shot. He intended to ride as fast as he could until his strength ran out. He would then hang on and hope for the best. With Craig on the point, the plan was in arrears. To make matters worse, with his best start of the season, Mike LaRocco was in touch with the leaders. Remember, LaRocco's come-from-behind rides in the first two races of the series were spectacular. Now consider McGrath's weakened condition. There's little doubt in the minds of most of the onlookers that LaRocco was in position to take the win. He passed Matasevich, then he made this mistake. The front end of his Kawasaki washed out. LaRocco went down. Matasevich, with nowhere to go, plowed into the fallen rider. As LaRocco struggled to get back in the race, he was passed by a half dozen riders. Considering those come from behind rides already in the book, LaRocco was still in contention, but he would need a bonsai charge to get close to the leaders. Jeremy McGrath, meanwhile, was trying to make good his game plan. He was still riding strong and wanted the lead. He almost got it, but Michael Craig cut him off in the corner, and McGrath dropped back to reassess the situation. Back to LaRocco. He's ballistic. He's charged back to sixth and looking hard for fifth. Watch this. Jeff Emig was the victim, and as you're about to see, an unhappy one at that. LaRocco, though, got a real kick out of the situation. Watch it again, and you decide, was there room to make the pass? Did LaRocco look before he leaped? Did Emig move in front of LaRocco? You be the judge and jury as we listen to the testimony from both riders. Yeah, I think I was running about fifth, you know, and uh, then uh, there was a little uh, step up into a corner, you know, like, you know, like, and I was taking the inside every lap, and uh, and for some reason, you know, he decided, you know, like, that he's just going to jump all the way over the obstacle, all the way into the corner, landed, you know, he landed right on top of me, you know, and he took me out, or, I mean, he took us both out. <laughs> well, actually, I was, uh, you know, I had went down once earlier, and, and I knew if I was going to be McGrath tonight that I had to go for it, and, you know, that's what I was doing. And I, I went for it on the inside in that corner, and, you know, it was not enough room, but I tried to force it, and, uh, you know, we went down. In, in the, you know, in the heat of the moment, you know, I was a little bit pissed, and I, you know, right when I got up, I was like, man, what, what? and I just, God just kicked him right in the back, you know. <laughs> no, actually, uh, he kicks like a girl, so <laughs> I really wasn't bothered by that, and, you know, when it happened, I really didn't even know he kicked me, but. 12 laps into the race, and Michael Craig was still out front, and despite his physical condition, Jeremy McGrath was still applying pressure. Craig finally cracked. McGrath took the lead. The excitement, though, was not over. Mike Kidrowski caught Craig and is about to move into second place. From there, in the closing laps, he chipped away at McGrath's lead. On the last lap, in striking position, Kidrowski tried a little too hard. The Kawasaki ace was able to pick himself up to hold on to second. McGrath, blue and all, sailed across the San Diego finish line to make it four in a row. The win tried McGrath with Rick Johnson for the most wins in two seasons of racing. 14. McGrath had 11 chances left to break the tie. Here's how the rest of the pack finished at round four. McGrath, Kidrowski, Craig, Lampson, Matasevich. Here are the second five, Ward, Swink, LaRocco, Stanton, and Emmy. Check the points. McGrath could set out round five and would still be the series points leader.
half needed lightning to strike one more time to tie another record, the most wins at the beginning of a season. Rick Johnson won five in 1989. Let's hear from the factory team manager. Well, up to this point, Han is very happy with what the team has done so far. Jeremy, probably a little bit more than we expected, winning all four of the first events. And uh, we have Jeff Stanton in second in the series, Steve Lampson's in fourth, and Doug Henry coming off of a pre-season injury is actually starting to improve week to week. So overall, knock on wood real well. Uh, right now, Team Suzuki is uh, getting back on track. Their uh, first couple races, we had a few troubles with uh, Brian falling, coming from the back of the pack, but he rode strong, and uh, we had a couple things on the bike to iron out. Things are looking better, and uh, Brian's back in his hometown, so he's pumped about that. Been a little bit rough this season for us. We started off real strong. LaRocca started off real strong, and then he suffered that setback with the mechanical DNF at Anaheim that put us back quite a ways in the points. So just looking at each race, one race at a time, trying to come back and uh, get back in the points race here. Kudrowski came out strong last week at San Diego with a second place finish, and I know he's feeling a lot better, so I'm sure we're going to see him back up in the top again. But as far as the series, it's uh, be just, you know, we're going to have to look at it as the full series length now and just get back up in it as far as we can. Uh, not satisfied, no, but I, I think actually from where the guys are, it's real good. We've been on the victory podium a couple times. We had expected, honestly, to win a race by now, but everything's coming together good, and there's tonight. And tonight was looking good for Yamaha. At this point, it was Craig, Matasevich, Kedrowski, McGrath, and with this pass on Lampson, the Rockos cracked the top five. As good as it was for Yamaha, it was that bad for Honda. Jeff Stanton, who later said he was taken out by Emig, was the first Honda rider out of contention. Then it was Jeremy McGrath's turn. Trying to get to the front of the pack, he ran off the track. When he came back on, he hit Brian Swing and crashed. The third Honda rider to hit the dirt was number eight, Doug Henry. Three quarters of the Honda team had crashed. Out front, Michael Craig knew none of that. What he did know was he was on the way to his first Supercross win. Um, I think I was in another world. Everybody was just, it seemed like everybody I looked at had the biggest grin on my face. I think I had the grin on my face all night. And the feeling that I had was just, I was thinking about my family at home and, you know, what they're going to be, you know, hearing from my mechanic when he called. And just so many things are going through my head that, you know, I wasn't really sitting there focusing on anybody certain. But uh, just that feeling was just incredible. Hugs all the way around for Craig and a victory ride for his good friend and tuner, Brian Lunas. The Tampa finishing order looked like this with McGrath recovering to finish fifth. Here are the second five. Jeff Matasevich, Ryan Hughes, Ward, Emig, and Buddy Antonin. Craig's win moved the first-year factory rider to second in the standing, while Stanton, who finished 17th, dropped from second to fifth. As the series traveled to Atlanta, the competition had proved positive that McGrath was not invincible. Perhaps it was wishful thinking or maybe the grasping of straws. Regardless, in the minds of some, that single loss opened the door. McGrath viewed it as a minor setback. Um, I think there was, there was 19 other guys that was after Jeremy, and um, I was one of the guys that stopped him. A lot of other guys out there are really hungry, and they're all going fast. So, you know, I, I think that uh, this ain't going to be the end of it. There are going to be a couple other guys that are going to be winning some races, and um, hopefully I can get a couple more. You know, last year and the beginning of this year, he was riding a pace of his own. And I think we've all kind of stepped up to that pace. Yeah, it could be, you know, one week. It probably didn't hurt his confidence that much, you know, being one weekend he fell. But if it happens again, then he's going to start wandering. And when he starts wandering, that, that just is going to make it tough for him, and he's going to start getting beat more and more. Well, I think there's a lot of guys out there that are pretty confident right now, and, you know, they probably don't realize that I'm sick and I'm not at my best right now. But I'm still hanging in there, so, I mean, as soon as I get better, then, then they have a real problem again. Action to this point in the race, including the Mike Kudrowski crash in the first corner and another poor start on the part of his teammate, Mike LaRocco. Jeff Emig was out front, followed by Suzuki's Brian Swink and Jeremy McGrath, who just passed Steve Lampson. Take a look at Mechanics Row. Confusing mass of pit boards? You bet. You see one that said Swink, crash in the next corner. Well, Brian Swink evidently did. Watch this. That quick, the best ride of the season for Brian Swink turned too much. The team Suzuki rider recovered to finish eighth on the night. With Swink out of the way, McGrath had a clear shot at Emig. The defending Supercross champ, who this week was recovering from a case of chicken pox, made the pass. 
Emig, apparently not afraid of the highly contagious virus, tried to keep pace, but no luck. Behind the leaders, the rest of Team Honda was involved, passing each other. Here's Stanton working on Lampson. Off the finish line jump, Stanton completes the pass. You know, Stanton's mechanic says, show me! Stanton drew a beat on Doug Henry, chased him through a set of small jumps, drew even with him in the midst of a triple, made the pass in the following corner. Jeff Stanton goes into third. Wyatt Seals says, hmm, I'll flash him the old show me sign again, see if it'll work twice. Stanton responded by moving to the rear wheel of Emig. The battle was on. Emig had been passed by one Honda rider, and he figured that was enough. He answered Stanton's challenge with a handful of throttle and a wide line in the corner that forced Stanton to back off the pace. But not for long. The three-time Supercross champ had it all together, but watch what happens as he takes the lead. After the contact, it was back on the gas for both riders. Stanton nearly ran off the track, but he never shut off. Emig hung tough, but the former champ had the best lines in the corners following the incident, and the pass was made. Let's take another look. Both riders later said it was incidental contact, but it looks from here like Emig could have put a little more effort into making the corner. With six laps to go, Mike LaRocco was in the middle of another come from off the pace charge. He had worked up to fifth place with the leaders in sight, then this. LaRocco's miscalculation carried him to the side of the track and into the bales. His charge for the night was over. We'll take another look. What I want you to watch is LaRocco as he realizes his error. He's going to try to adjust his landing in midair. LaRocco finished seventh on the night. After taking the lead on lap five of the 20-lap main event, McGrath, chicken pox and all, turned in an error-free ride to claim his fifth win of the season. Check out the finishing positions. It's Jeremy McGrath on top, followed by Stanton, Jeff Emig, Michael Craig, then Steve Lampson rounding out the top five. Kidrowski, LaRocco, Swink, Henry, and Cliff Palmer aboard the KTM were the next five riders. Here are the point standings. Jeremy McGrath, 141 on top. From Georgia, the Supercross Series returned to Florida and Daytona Beach for round seven of the 15-race series. Because the race was televised by a network other than ESPN, we are not allowed to bring you video of the event. The winner for the second year in a row was Kawasaki's Mike Kidrowski. Um, well, it just, you know, the race went really good. Um, we pre prepared for it really good through the week, and uh, me and my mechanic Shane just did a lot of testing, a lot of riding and stuff at sand tracks, and... Uh, you know, we went there and everything went, you know, the way everything was planned to be. And, uh, you know, that's how you win races, when everything goes perfect, and it did there. For those fans who have no idea what Daytona was like at all, that are seeing this show, okay, what were those plans, and how did they pan out as far as the track itself and your victory? Um, well, you know, at Daytona, it's kind of a different track that we race in Supercross. So uh, we went there, and we kind of got our bike set up for a sand track, sort of, you know, different kind of suspension, maybe not as stiff for the jumps and stuff. And, and uh, we went there with the attitude, you know, we wanted to go in there and win the heat race to get a good pick on the gate because it starts really critical at Daytona and, you know, be up there in the front right at the beginning. And, and you know, that's what happened in the main event. I was right up there in the front, and uh, me and Stan had a good battle for, you know, the first half of the race. And it was just, you know, who was going to be the strongest, who could jump every jump, every lap. And that's a big key there, too. And, and uh, you know, I held on, jumped every jump. I think I missed one because of a lapper, and that's the way you win Daytona. Here are the top five finishers at Daytona. Kidrowski, Stanton, Morocco, McGrath, and Henry. Mike Kidrowski moved to second place after winning the Daytona round in the standings, while Michael Craig with the DNF went from second to fifth. From the Sunshine State in Daytona Beach to the Hoosier Dome in the heartland of the Midwest, the main event is underway with Jeff Emig out front, followed by Jeff Matasevich, Craig, and series points leader Jeremy McGrath. Per usual, Mike LaRocco was mired somewhere in the middle of the pack. Coming up over the finish line jump, a Mike Craig miscue and a Jeremy McGrath stroke of good luck. Had McGrath jumped a few inches to his right, his season could well have been over. We'll take another look, but first, let's check on Mike LaRocco. From nearby South Bend, in front of his friends and fans, he probably would have sold his soul for a hole shot. He needed to keep up with Emmy. Let's go back to that near disaster. He kind of came up short on the finish line jump. 
and I was right behind him. And then he landed, and I had to turn it sideways trying to land beside him, and then he bounced up and landed on my hand, and I think it pinched his finger, so he reached out and grabbed me to hold himself up. As the 20-lap main event neared the midway mark, the battle for the lead began to heat up. Jeff Emig out front was being chased by the privateer Jeff Matasevich, who in turn was pursued by McGrath. When Matasevich followed Emig deep into the corner, McGrath saw the hole and took over the runner-up spot. Once passed, Matasevich seemed to slow slightly. In short order, he was caught up in a battle for third with Craig in the rocket. Let's go to the mechanic signal area. Jeremy's wrench. Skip, we know Jeremy's in great shape. It looks like he's sitting there just sizing up Emmett. You think that's what he's doing? Yeah, I think. Well, he, well, he tried to make a move right there. Oh, yeah, we just got it. So uh, he sat back. Uh, I mean, that hoop sex is pretty tough, but you try to push it, you may go down. Uh, we're out front now. Let's uh, see if we can extend this lead a little bit. The battle for the lead was over, so the attention of the crowd was drawn to the battle for third. Matasevich appeared to tire made mistakes that led to Michael Craig taking third and Mike LaRocco fourth. One more pass would take place as McGrath heads for the checkered flag. Mike LaRocco thrilled the hometown crowd by passing Craig to garner a position on the winner's roster. For Jeremy, it was six wins on the season out of the eight events held to date. It was becoming obvious the championship was McGrath's to lose. The competition had found no chinks in the armor. Here are the results. Behind McGrath, it was Emmy, LaRocco, Craig, and Mike Kitrowski finishing fifth. Second five, Huffman, Matasevich, Swink, and Jeff Stanton rounding out the top ten. Here are the point standings. McGrath with a huge point lead, 184 to 137 over Kitrowski. There are two unique features concerning Charlotte's Memorial Stadium, round nine of the series. One, it's the smallest stadium with the tightest track in the schedule, and two, perhaps due to feature number one, exciting race action at the venue is virtually nonstop. 1994 was no exception. Before we get to the main event, watch the start of the second heat of the night and the season's biggest crash. At the same time, we'll listen to a few of the riders involved. The crash was triggered by Emmy. Well, I drove it in pretty deep, and, and uh, you know, when I was kind of making my turn, you know, in between the jumps, it was, a, you know, it was like mud or something, you know, and the front end just fully washed on me. And, you know, I think just about everybody ran into me. Well, actually, Emig made a little mistake and kind of crashed into me. I thought I was second, but we all fell on each other, and it was just a one big cattle car. Even if it was myself that would have went down, it would have happened. You know, it still could happen in the main event to whoever, you know, just because it's just a, sh a sharp left and then a sharp right back again. So, you know, he didn't purposely cause it. And so you can't put all the blame on him, but he's the one that caused it. The crash collected such notables as Jeff Emig, Jeremy McGrath, Jeff Stanton, Brian Swink, and Cliff Palmer. Those same five riders took the top five positions in the second semifinal to move into the main. And how did they fare in the main? Did they learn what not to do in corner number one? In almost a carbon copy of the start of the second heat, McGrath, Stanton, Palmer, Swink, and all either crashed or were held up in the corner. Jeff Emmett got another good hole shot. He stayed upright and emerged from the corner right behind Doug Henry. Then came Larry Ward, LaRocco, Lampson, Ryan Hughes, and in seventh, Mike Kudrowski. Fourth place on the opening lap is a rarity for LaRocco. The team Kawasaki rider knew that and intended to take full advantage of the situation. He immediately put the pressure on Ward. Ward went deep into a hairpin intending to block LaRocco, but LaRocco foiled that plan by squaring the corner and stealing the best line into the next corner. LaRocco was in third. In front of him, Jeff Emming is about to make a bid for the lead. He pulls alongside Henry, then exiting the corner, the rear end of his Yamaha slides out. Jeff Emig is on the ground, and LaRocco will go into second place. Let's check it again. Jay Springsteen might have made the save here, but not Jeff Emig. While that was going on, Mike Kidrowski had moved from seventh to fourth. Now that set up this three-way battle for runner-up honors. Emig took a shot at LaRocco, but did not have the momentum to complete the pass. Now remember, LaRocco had inherited second place via an Emig mistake. He gave it back with a mistake of his own. LaRocco, with a secure second place, dropped all the way back to fourth. Watch it again and listen to LaRocco's post-race comments. Uh, I think when I got off front, I rode a little stiff at the beginning part of the race, and I ended up making a mistake, and I let uh, Mike and Jeff go back around. So uh, after that point, then things started happening. 
Kidrowski was the first thing that happened. When, when we came into a turn, he just got really close underneath me and, uh, you know, kind of pushed me out. And I had nowhere else to go, so I kind of had to just go with the flow. And, you know, he got around me. It was a, you know, it was a good pass, I mean, aggressive pass. And, you know, that's what I should have done earlier on in the race. One lap later in what has become Morocco's favorite part of the track, the Kawasaki rider put a block pass on Emig that again gave him control of second place. Teammate Mike Kudrowski was able to take advantage of the situation, and he too passed Emig. In the mechanic's signal area, Big Mike, Morocco's father and tuner, liked what he saw, did his part by clearing traffic. Doug Henry was next on the hit list. I went out wide, and I didn't realize he was so close, and he just kind of, I kind of went up and squared, and he snuck inside me, and I kind of drove into him, and he drove into me, and, uh, you know, it just kind of pushed, forced me off the track, you know, there was nothing really, nothing I could really do, you know, if I had known he was a little closer, I probably could have stuck inside and jumped to doubles, but then he probably would have went on the outside and did the triple and passed me anyways. <laughs> I set him up, and, you know, I, I gave him the option to either, you know, let me go by or we're going to hit, so... You know, it was just a race move. It wasn't something that I tried to do to knock anybody down, you know, and it ended up working for me. It worked well enough to give Kawasaki first and second on the night, and Mon Pa LaRocco reason to celebrate. For Mike LaRocco, it was career win number four. Both Kawasaki riders gained in the point chase as McGrath finished seventh due to the first corner crash. When it was over, Mike and Mike talked about the race. Uh, this is just kind of track you got to be aggressive on and you know I wasn't right like myself early in a race and you know after I made those mistakes I told myself I ain't blowing another one so I went back at it. Uh, you know I'm pretty happy with Kawasaki getting up in front you know both of us finished first and second and uh, you know it's just I didn't ride aggressive enough out there I should have been slamming like he was and you know that's that's the way you have to do it out there on the tracks right now you know some of the tracks are real tight and that's the only way you can pass, you know, it's not wide enough to have two lines in some of the turns and stuff. The second heat is underway. McGrath and Stanton are about to tangle. Both riders blame the other. I was going in the rut, just take my time because I was right behind the swing and uh, he just ran right in the back of me, I guess. Well, that's stupid, you know, I, I couldn't, you know, I mean, I was just following right behind. I mean, it's a tight corner, of course, but you know, it's just people don't use their brains, you know. Hey, he went down in front of me. I don't know what he's saying. He's probably saying I took him out, but I know what happened to him. The rut's really deep, and your 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 foot peg and rear brake gets caught on it and picks your rear tire up, and you just don't go nowhere. And then, then I did hit him because he, he would hit that, and his rear tire went up, and then I hit him, and then we both fell down. Now, lest you think McGrath was the only rider having trouble with the ruts, check this out. Same heat race. Doug Henry, contesting for the lead, ends up in the bales. A few seconds later, Jeff Emig will suffer a similar fate. The ruts in Pontiac were vicious. Watch Emig. Last lap of the heat, McGrath was all the way up to fifth. He needs to pass one more rider to make it to the main. Two mistakes in the same race? For McGrath, that's unheard of. The defending champ is headed to the semifinals. No problem, you say? After all, all he needs in the semis is a fifth place or better, and he's in the main event. Here is the semi. Jeff Emmett gets the whole shot. Larry Brooks dropping down from the middle of the pack. They make a sandwich out of McGrath. Well, McGrath recovered to come out of the corner in third. Good place to watch Emmett make this mistake. Now, from that point, it should have been easy. It was not. McGrath was bound for the first time in his career for the last chance qualifier. First time in the last chance, you know, it's unfortunate, but uh, had a little bit of bad luck and uh, heat race, I think, uh, you know, tangled with one of my teammates and, you know, that's all right, but the semi, I got some dirt in my brake, so the bike wasn't going, it was wanting to stop, so it's unfortunate, you know, I had to ride the last chance, but well, I, I guess to my advantage, I guess I'm warm. <laughs> Again, it boiled down to a last lap situation. Pass Larry Brooks and go to the main. Don't make the pass, and he'll have to go to that last chance qualifier. You already know that he is going to come up short by a couple of bike lengths. Not to worry, McGrath won the first last chance qualifier of his career and was in the main event. One problem, though, McGrath was on the extreme outside of the start line. Now, the danger here is going into the first corner, the rest of the field will have a tendency to drift to the outside. But watch what happens when the gate drops.
Harry Kehoe, rider number 15 from Honda of Troy, was the only rider to beat McGrath through the corner. In the jumps that followed, McGrath rectified that situation and took the lead. How did he do it? Well, let's take another look at the start. McGrath later said it was a calculated risk. He kept the throttle whipped up. He'll cut across the front of the pack and emerge with a clean track in front of him. I think it's safe to say that in this situation, lightning struck the Pontiac field. Back to race action. Doug Henry is in second place, followed by Larry Ward. Stanton and Emig are fighting over fourth. Now that duel ends in the upcoming corner. Emig throws up his arms in disbelief, but Jeff, it really did happen. It was just a couple of races ago that Stanton claimed Emig took him out. Watch again and pay attention to Jeff Stanton's line. You decide if he had honed in on Emig's rear wheel or if he thought Emig might be gone when he got there. McGrath at this point was gone. The crowd needed someone else to watch, and per usual, that someone was Mike LaRocco, who in typical LaRocco fashion had started off the pace. LaRocco has passed more riders on Supercross tracks than anyone in the history of the sport, and in Pontiac, he would add to his impressive list. With Stanton out of the way, LaRocco forged to the front and caught Larry Ward. Now, Larry Ward will not shy away from the battle. Through ruts, over jumps, and through the tight Silver Dome corners, the pair of riders hammered each other in a great side-by-side -side battle. In the early part of the season, Ward had gotten good starts, but it quickly faded. But as the series progressed, he and the Nolene Sizzler Yamaha developed staying power. At the Silver Dome, he was tough to get around. Finally, Mike LaRocco was able to put him away. The battle with Ward carried both riders to the rear wheel of Doug Henry in second place. LaRocco had momentum on his side and easily made the pass. But hold on, there's more to come. McGrath by now had a huge lead. He was in cruise control. He had time to cross the finish line, pull into the pits, get off his bike, and watch this last lap, last corner battle for second place. Uh, back and forth, back and forth in the last turn. Fortunate for me, I was in the worst position during the last turn, and it turned out for the best. Those guys, both great competitors, were going for the second place finish. and. Uh, when they went down, I snuck around the inside, and uh, I was a happy man. You know, I got out there, and I got hit with the rock on my clutch finger, and, you know, I figured the last lap, just keep it up, stay in the ruts, and, you know, pull off second. Because Jeremy was too far ahead, but, uh, you know, I got a little too lazy, and, you know, it cost me. Mike LaRocco was the first to recover. He picked himself up, crossed the finish line in third place. So it was McGrath, Ford, LaRocco, Henry, and Mike Kudrowski rounding out the top five in the Silver Dome. Then Craig, Stanton, Damon Huffman, Steve Lampson, and Jeff Emig rounding out the top ten. Here are the standings. McGrath, LaRocco, Kidrowski, Stanton, and Emig in that order with McGrath way out front. Although three other riders had won Supercross main events thus far in the season, only one had consistently been McGrath's equal. That, of course, was LaRocco, but in Minnesota, LaRocco fell victim once again to the bad start blues. He was the victim of a crash in corner number one. Here's another victim. The kicking legs belonged to Steve Lampson, who found himself pinned under Jeff Emig's Yamaha. Lampson suffered minor burns from Emig's exhaust pipe, but was able to continue. At the end of the opening lap, Matasevich out front, followed by Craig, Henry, McGrath, Ward, Stanton, Kidrowski was in 11th, and LaRocco was in 12th. Craig wasted little time going to the front of the pack with an inside line on Matasevich and a block pass at the end of the next jump-filled straightaway. Now, the block pass is coming up. Michael Craig, since winning in Tampa, had not performed to his or Yamaha's expectations. First-year factory rider had missed a race, pulled off the track in another. Minnesota win would go a long way in the wound healing department. While that was going on, McGrath was lurking and watching. He felt the time was right. McGrath cleared a tabletop jump, passed Doug Henry for third. The following right hand, he took Henry's momentum away and set his sights on the riders in front of him. Matasevich was next in line. Watch from the sky cam. McGrath makes the move to second to look easy. When McGrath is on, he seems to be on at every race. Everything he does looks easy. 14 laps into the race, McGrath had run down Michael Craig and was applying constant pressure. And finally, Michael Craig would crack. A slight bobble was all it took. McGrath was the leader headed toward his eighth win of the season. On the last lap, with a huge crowd cheering him on, showtime emerged. The crowd wanted a knack-knack. 
McGrath gave him a knack knack. As he neared the finish line jump, the crowd was on their feet in anticipation, and McGrath said, thank you very much. Michael Craig brought a number 19. The team Yamaha ace settled for the number two position. It was Kudrowski in third, Henry in fourth, with Mike LaRocco taking fifth. Let's take a look at the next five, Stanton, Ward, Swink, Matasevich, and Palmer. Mike Kudrowski's third place finish, coupled with LaRocco's fifth, moved Kudrowski back into second place in the championship standings. Dallas was next. We'll make the trip with Skip Norfolk, Jeremy's mechanic. Well, about six hours ago, we were still at the races, sending the last fans off, and now we're sending off ourselves. We're going to pack up and head to Dallas. See, this is where the co-pilot is supposed to help during all the unloading and loading procedures. So that leaves me to do it all. Well, fortunately, this road trip, we've been able to bring back four first place trophies. Uh, pretty fortunate. Things have been going good this year. Progress, and here's all you need to know as we join the race in the closing laps. McGrath and Kudrowski both got top five starts. Morocco, where else would he be but at the back of the pack? He started 15. Midway mark of the 20 lap main event, McGrath had the lead. Kudrowski was a ways back in second. Morocco was a long way back in third. With that one and a half laps to go, Kudrowski had run McGrath down, and Morocco was right behind. Kudrowski got around McGrath. Now keep in mind that McGrath, assuming he kept his nose clean and stayed out of trouble, had a virtual lock on the title. Smart Money says, after he was passed by Kudrowski, the thing to do was settle for second place. And if LaRocco was determined to make a pass, let him go, settle for third. After all, the championship is the ultimate goal, and the only way McGrath could lose it this late in the season would be the result of an injury. An injury caused by, one, a careless mistake. Forget that. And the pressure is on, McGrath makes no mistakes. Or two, an injury caused by crashing with another rider. White flag coming up, and watch what happens. McGrath went to the inside of Kudrowski, drop kicked him out of the way, and was back in the lead. McGrath has always said he races to have fun and that each race is important to him, more important than the championship. Watch the rest of the last lap, and you'll believe like I do that when McGrath says those things, he's not just blowing smoke. Kudrowski talks about the last lap and a half. Yeah, you know, I, I got up in the second behind Jeremy, and, and you know, I was, he was riding pretty smooth and pretty fast, and I was just trying to keep insisting, you know, at the end of the race, I knew I'd be stronger, and, and uh, he made a mistake, didn't jump the triple, and I got by, but maybe I was riding a little too cautious, or he was riding more aggressive, and he got me back, and then through the whoops, I said, I'm either going for it or falling down, you know, and went through it, and I had him, and he just went inside of me and caught my front wheel and just looped his bike out, so... Yeah, I almost had the win. While Kudrowski and McGrath were picking themselves up, Mike LaRocco picked his way through the carnage to take the win. 
Uh, look good, actually. Uh, what happened exactly? What was I was hoping to happen? I just came back. Uh, I came from a long ways back, and I fiddled around with them for too long. And you know, those guys have a little bit of edge on me that I wasn't quite making up. So yeah, I just hung back, and hopefully something happened, and it did. Well, watch it one more time. Pay attention to the way that Jeremy McGrath hits the ground and the way he rolls. That was the kind of crash that easily breaks bones and breaks championship dreams. So Mike LaRocco in the right place at the right time took the win. He was followed by Kudrowski, McGrath, Jeff Emig, rounding out the top five, Larry Ward. Are you wondering about the fight and the harsh words in the pits when it was over? Check it out. <laughs> Would you believe they thought that was fun? Three races remaining in a 50-point lead. McGrath could sew up the title by winning at the next round in Seattle. We'll join the race in progress. McGrath is out front, but just like in Dallas with two laps to go, Mike Kikrowski was closing from second place, and he was closing at a rapid pace. It was obvious something was wrong. Now, coming up, you'll see Jeremy McGrath riding through the mechanic's signal area. I'm going to tell you right now to keep your eye on McGrath's left arm. Now, don't forget, he was in position to wrap up the championship here in Seattle. He points down to the rear of the motorcycle. It was a flat tire. His choice, take chances, try for the win on a very unstable bike, or slow the pace and ensure a finish. He chose the latter. Kidrowski quickly closed the gap. He knew McGrath had a major problem, and it was just a matter of time. Now in the next corner, McGrath will swing wide, giving Kudrowski all the room that he needs to make the pass. The question then was, would McGrath be able to stay in front of Morocco? Again, McGrath was faced with a choice of trying to ride at speed to hold his position or to continue at a pace that would allow Morocco the easy pass. McGrath again, and wisely so, chose the latter course of action. Unable to negotiate the triple, he was passed by Mike Morocco with ease. For Kudrowski, it would be win number two of the season and for the second time in as many races, with Morocco finishing second, Kawasaki claimed the first two spots. So McGrath would have to wait at least one more race to secure the title, and a new record of 11 wins in a single season would not be set. After the race, Jeremy discussed his problem. Yeah, about two laps to go, two and a half laps to go. I got a flat and, you know, tough luck. I, I couldn't do nothing with it. I knew that Mike was coming. He was coming on strong. I was pacing myself on, you know, the way I look at it is he got pretty lucky. Well, you know what they say, Jeremy. It's good to be good, but it's better to be lucky. So Kidrowski takes the win, followed by LaRocco, McGrath, Lampson, Larry Ward. Then came Emig, Henry, Button, Kehoe, and Larry Brooks in 10th. Here are the point standings. With two races to run, McGrath is 46 points ahead of Kidrowski, 48 ahead of LaRocco. The season was winding down. Round 14, San Jose. McGrath needs a 17th place to clinch the title. Today is no different from any other day. You know, I, I woke up the same this morning and uh, come out to ride my own race. I want to win the race. I mean, I know that I don't have to win the race to win the championship, but I don't want to win like that. I, I want to win each race individually, so I'm going to be doing my best to win the race. Is there any question in your mind that if Jeremy McGrath does his best, that he wouldn't win the race? He backed up his pre-race intentions by coming out of the first corner in third place. And before Larry Ward had time to assess the situation, McGrath was alongside. He moved into second in this corner with a block pass. Ward drops back to third. McGrath now sets his sights on the leader, Jeff Emming. Meanwhile, Mike LaRocco was doing his by now familiar thing. He was recovering from a not so good start. Here, LaRocco puts the move on Steve Lampson to take over for him. LaRocco now set his sights on moving to the front of the pack and challenging McGrath for the win. Meanwhile, McGrath had his hands full at the front of the pack with Jeff Emig. The two riders were at war. McGrath drew alongside Emig over the finish line jump, thought he had him, but Emig squared the corner and held on to the number one position. Now, you remember Mike LaRocco? Well, you remember this section. That's where LaRocco passed Steve Lampson. This time, he gets the line on Larry Ward, and LaRocco's in third place. The battle with Ward had carried LaRocco to within sighting distance of the two leaders. 
in front of LaRocco. McGrath was as close to Emick as he could get. He knew LaRocco was coming. He didn't want to be around when he got there. He needed the pass. Or did he? Remember, 17th place would sew up the championship. But then again, you have to remember that Jeremy McGrath is not interested in 17th place. He wants the win. Now watch this altercation. McGrath had made the pass. Emig tried to hook back to the inside of him, clipped his rear wheel. Both riders went down. McGrath talks about the crash. Well, Jeff was riding great. You know, I, I didn't do anything on purpose. I was trying to go to the inside. And he, I mean, he was protecting his line, trying to, and I blocked him. I mean, he could have stopped, but instead he grabbed a lot of throttle and ran right in the back of me. So, I mean, a lot of it's his fault, I'd say. I mean, I just went for the block. He could have stopped or went outside. Well, from that point, the race was over. Mike LaRocco had gone into the number one position while McGrath and Emick were picking themselves up off the ground. LaRocco was in cruise control. He was headed for his third victory of the season. McGrath, meanwhile, would hold on to the runner-up slot to claim the championship as he crossed the finish line jump to take the checkered flag. Here are the results from San Jose. Mike LaRocco, Jeremy McGrath, that's all you need to know. Jeremy McGrath retained his 1993 Supercross Championship crown. He makes it two in a row as Duke Finch presents the number one plate. Congratulations on back-to-back -back championships from the AMA and all your fans. Good job. Thanks a lot, Duke. Um, I appreciate that from the AMA. I've worked really hard for this championship for the second year in a row. I'd like to thank one of Hannah Collect, Honda, my parents. You know, they do a great job cheering me on, and my biggest fans. And uh, my mechanic, Skip Norfolk, he's doing a great job. Thanks. Congratulations to Jeremy McGrath for winning the championship. There is still, though, one more race to run. Good job, son. second consecutive year the results of the final race of the season would be meaningless in terms of deciding the championship still the race would go on with every competitor giving their all when the gate dropped in the final main event of the season temperatures were close to 100 degrees in the extreme heat 20 riders screamed through corner number one 25 laps to go and 1994 would be reduced to a single page in the supercross record book it was only fitting in the final event of the season that jeremy mcgrath would lead the way and it was only fitting that once more Mike LaRocco would charge from out of the pack. He passed Doug Henry, went after Michael Craig. Through the long whoop sections and over mountainous jumps, LaRocco's pursuit was relentless. His persistence paid off like it had so many times in 94, and the pass was made. While LaRocco was working to get through traffic, McGrath was taking advantage of a clear track, nothing to impede his progress. McGrath began to open a big lead. McGrath had lost three races in a row coming into Vegas. It was the longest drought of his career, and it was McGrath's intent to bring it to an end. To get to McGrath, Mike LaRocco needed to pass one more rider. That was Jeff Matasevich. He stalked the privateer. Then when the hole opened up, LaRocco went through. But on this night in Las Vegas, LaRocco's charge would end with second place. Perhaps it was the heat and the energy that LaRocco spent getting into second, or perhaps it was a championship ride on the part of McGrath that echoed his championship season. Regardless, as McGrath coasted to the checkered flag, he had doubled his lead over LaRocco, and thus the season ended. Fifteen races and six long months. From one end of the country to the other, then back again. The checkered flag waved for a final time and the 1994 Supercross season came to a close. Here are the results of the final race of the season. McGrath, LaRocco, Kidrowski, Matasevich, Doug Henry rounding out the top five. Here are the next five. It's Emig, Lampson, Lusk, Ward, and Jimmy Gaddis. Let's go to the winner's circle. Uh, not as well as I liked, you know. I got out to a mediocre start, and I didn't get to the pack like I needed to, and it took a little out of me, and I just didn't have the, you know, the bonsai mode to catch up and win this one. Well, you know, I haven't, this is the longest winning streak that I haven't won, and uh, I definitely wanted to prove a point. Hold on, I'm getting lightheaded. I want to sit down. Okay. That's cool. That makes for good TV. Well, it's the best year. I mean, last year I got 12th in the standings. This year, second, and, uh, you know, if I can increase any more, hopefully first. Well, 
I knew I'd get a little bit winded, so, you know, I just worked as hard as I could for the first, as many laps as I could, and my mouth was totally dry, and, uh, you know, he wasn't catching me, I was, I was putting in some good laps, and actually I was pulling on him, so I was happy with that, and I just wanted to keep up the pace as long as I could. Last, last two laps I slowed down a little bit. Here are the final standings of the 1994 Supercross season. Jeremy McGrath, 335 points, Morocco finished second, then Kudrowski, Emig, and Steve Lampson. For McGrath, nine wins on the year as he laid to rest 1994. For LaRocco and the rest of the field, it was a year of frustration. A year of what could have been, but wasn't. It was a year where lightning had struck twice.